Up to this point, you've learned most of the skills required to fly the aircraft solely by reference to the instruments. Soon, you will be ready for your first IFR cross-country flight. Although thorough pre-flight planning is essential for any cross-country, it becomes even more important when the flight is conducted under instrument rules. By regulation, you're required to acquaint yourself with all available information, including the weather, fuel requirements, and any known traffic delays. You must also have an alternate course of action in case your original flight cannot be completed as planned. To illustrate the proper steps, let's plan a flight between Miles City, Montana and Jamestown, North Dakota. The night before your flight, you check the weather along your route and find that high pressure dominates the Miles City area. The forecast is for VFR conditions to prevail into central North Dakota. There is also a low pressure system located in southern Minnesota with a stationary front extending northward into Canada. Both ahead of and behind this front, there have been widespread areas of low ceilings and poor visibility. However, the IFR weather is forecast to move out of the Jamestown area by the time you arrive. Current weather at Jamestown is 300 overcast with a half mile visibility. Because the weather might not move as quickly as forecast, you decide to play it safe and plan for an IFR flight. You begin your planning by gathering up the materials you'll need, including the en route chart, approach charts for the departure, destination, and alternate airports, and the airport facility directories for the area you're flying through. You will also need a navigation log, flight computer, and any other material you would normally use to plan a cross-country flight. The first thing you should do is check to see if there is a preferred IFR route for your flight. Preferred IFR routes are listed in the en route section of the Jeppesen Airway Manual and in the airport facility directory. To determine if preferred IFR routes exist, look for the city near your departure point. There are no preferred IFR routes between Miles City and Jamestown. You should also check for any special arrival and overflight routes. Again, there is nothing for your flight. By referring to the chart, you determine the easiest and most direct route is to follow Victor II through Dickinson and Bismarck, and then to Jamestown. While you're looking at the chart, you should also take the time to select a possible alternate in case a diversion is necessary. Bismarck seems to be a good choice for a couple of reasons. One, it has an instrument approach, and two, it is along your route of flight. Remember, the IFR conditions are moving to the east, so if the weather is good when you pass over Bismarck, it should remain the same or get better if it becomes necessary to backtrack. Once you have the route in mind, record the necessary information on the navigation log. This includes the fixes, route, and distances between fixes. You should also note the MEA for each segment. The highest is 6,000 feet between Mile City and Dickinson. Then consult the chart notums to see if any of the navigation aids along your route are affected. Although the Dickinson DME is temporarily shut down, this outage shouldn't affect your flight since DME is not required to navigate on Victor II. However, you won't be able to receive distance measurements from Dickinson, so you'll have to keep track of your position by using other VORs in the area. You'll want to keep this in mind when selecting your cruising altitude. Once the route is established, you need to check the approach charts for more specific information. First, you need to find out if there's an IFR departure procedure for your departure airport. Miles City doesn't have either one. It's also a good practice to study the approach charts at the departure airport in case you must make an unscheduled return after you take off. Using the approach chart, check to see what communications frequencies are used at the airport and record them on the nav log. Turning to your destination airport, 
check to see if there's a standard terminal arrival route. You find that there isn't a star for this area. However, Jamestown does have a variety of approaches, including an ILS with minimums of 200 feet and a half mile visibility. You should also take a few minutes to study the Jamestown Airport diagram. Familiarity with the taxiways and runways can be very helpful for ground operations and for orientation if you need to make a circling approach. You should also review the airport information of your possible alternate. In addition to the approaches available, you should check the alternate minimums so you'll know if you can use Bismarck when filing for an alternate. In this case, the minimums are 602 using the ILS approaches, or 802 when using the Radar 1 or VORA approaches. Referring to the airport facility directory, check the listings for the destination and alternate airports for such things as fuel availability, services, and special airport precautions. For example, at Jamestown, the airport is attended continuously and you should be alert for birds on and in the vicinity of the airport. Before your flight, you may also want to brush up on ATC procedures by reviewing the Aeronautical Information Manual. Although it is not necessary for every flight, it is a good practice to periodically review the AIM to keep abreast of any recent changes. The morning of the flight, you should call the flight service station for a standard weather briefing to determine if the weather has improved as forecast. The briefing reveals that the expected improvement in conditions did not occur. IFR weather still dominates eastern North Dakota and Minnesota. Miles City is currently reporting good VFR weather with 10,000 scattered and 30 miles visibility. Dickinson is reporting 6,000 broken and 15 miles visibility. Bismarck is currently IFR with a 2,000 foot overcast and two miles visibility. At Jamestown, your destination, the last reported weather was 700 overcast and two miles visibility with surface winds from 310 at six knots. Winds aloft for the route are generally westerly at less than 10 knots through 12,000 feet for Montana and Western North Dakota and light and variable through 12,000 feet for Eastern North Dakota. Notums indicate that the Jamestown ILS runway 3-1 glide slope is out of service. After gathering all the weather information, you realize you'll have to file for an alternate, since the forecast weather at Jamestown is below 2003. You should then compare the current and forecast conditions with the available approaches and minimums. With the surface winds at Jamestown from 310 at six knots, you'll probably fly a straight in approach and landing on runway 31. The reported weather is 500 feet above the lowest approach into Jamestown, but with the glide slope out of service, the landing minimums have increased to 1,880 feet, which is still 315 feet below the reported ceiling. After reviewing the winds and temperatures aloft forecast, you select a cruising altitude of 7,000 feet. This altitude keeps you above the minimum en route altitudes and conforms to the IFR cruising altitudes. It should also let you receive the necessary VORs during the section of the flight when you won't be able to receive DME information. Using the forecast winds at that altitude, compute the estimated ground speed and the estimated time en route between checkpoints. This also includes the information back to your alternate. The fuel requirements for this flight include enough to fly from Miles City to Jamestown, then to the alternate, plus a 45 minute reserve at cruise power. You determine that you need a minimum of 44 gallons. After filling out the flight plan, you're ready to go. Because IFR flight plans require at least 30 minutes for processing, you may want to file at this time so it will be available when you're ready to depart. Before you leave, however, you might want to visualize the flight. For example, after departure, you should expect to quickly intercept the 062 radial of Miles City Vortac, which is Victor 2. 
Also, you can expect to contact Salt Lake City Center on 126.85. While on the airway, you know that you won't be able to receive DME from Dickinson, so you'll need to determine your position by tuning in Williston on 116.3. When within 20 miles of Dickinson, you'll likely be told to contact Minneapolis Center on 135.2. Over Bismarck, you'll want to check the weather in case you have to divert back here if you can't get into Jamestown. With the winds at Jamestown, you figure you'll be cleared for the localizer approach to runway 31. If this happens, you'll most likely fly to the Jamestown Vortac. Then you'll navigate to the LOM and perform a procedure turn to get lined up for the approach. To do this, you'll fly outbound on the 126 degree radial of Jamestown for 5.8 miles or track to the Sabin LOM. From there, you will be using the localizer frequency of 109.3 to track outbound for approximately two minutes. Your outbound course will be 127 degrees. You'll complete the procedure turn by turning left to a heading of 082 degrees. After one minute, you'll make a 180 degree right turn and fly a heading of 262 degrees to intercept the localizer inbound. Since the glide slope is inoperative, you'll begin your descent at the final approach fix, which is Sabin Outer Marker, or the 6.4 DME fix of the Jamestown localizer, not the VOR. The MDA for this approach with the glide slope out will be 1,880 feet. You will probably fly the approach at a ground speed of 70 knots. That means you'll be at the missed approach point four minutes, 22 seconds after passing the final approach fix. You can also identify the missed approach point when you're at Jamestown Localizer's 1.3 DME fix. If you don't have the runway environment in sight at that time, you'll perform a missed approach, which is to climb to 3,200 feet, then make a right turn and proceed direct to the Sabin LOM and hold. Then, depending on the weather conditions, you'll either request another approach or request a clearance to your alternate. You might also want to look at the other approaches at Jamestown to see if there's anything unusual which might cause you a problem. By visualizing the flight before you actually get in the airplane, you've formulated a plan of action which should make the flight easier, safer, and less stressful. As you have seen, a good planning sequence is important for any IFR flight. Development of good IFR planning skills can eliminate disorganization and assist you in your in-flight decision making. With a good route choice, an understanding of the weather, and a knowledge of the factors that could affect your flight, you will not only save time and money, but will greatly reduce the possibility of an unpleasant surprise during your trip. <laughs>